so today we're going to talk about doing research in schools, in particular the research project we've been doing at Ross. I hope there'll be discussion about it. Uh, I'm going to pause regularly to ask for uh, questions or comments. Uh, and uh, uh, we're going to talk about the tools we're creating for assessing learning in context. So we're, uh, we're creating a whole new way of assessing learning, which involves uh, uh, actually talking to our students, would you believe it? <laughs> uh, uh, and asking them, uh, you know, like, what happens when a ball is bouncing? What happens to the energy in the ball? Or, or what, ha uh, what do you think about different cultures? <laughs> Uh, uh, and uh, 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 in, uh, so I'm going to talk about that research project uh, uh, after I give you a little bit of uh, a few background concepts. I can't resist talking a little bit about the brain, right, even though that's not the major focus today. <coughs> uh, and, uh, and we're going to focus on what, uh, what we call cosmopolitanism. That's a name that's actually been around for a very long time, uh, 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 and that's what you guys do. Uh, uh, in terms of philosophy, that, uh, that, the, that you're trying to help people understand what they're like in the world, how their culture relates to other cultures, how their language relates to other languages. Um, so, uh, so that's what the focus is going to be. Um, and um, uh, if, uh, there we go. Uh, you, you know who the person is on the right. <laughs> Uh, and the one in the middle, the one on the left is Christina Hinton, who's the uh, uh, co-author on all this. It's actually her dissertation, so she's doing much more of the work than I am. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, uh, this is uh, what, uh, a kind of representation of uh, the emotions that we feel when we have, uh, when we talk to, uh, to um, Ross students and Ross alumni. We interviewed about 50 Ross students and alumni uh, for this study, uh, and uh, uh, the, their, their uh, approach to uh, different cultures around the world was just amazing. Uh, they floored us regularly with the way they were talking. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, and th this kind of represents uh, uh, and a little kid version of uh, the way they were talking about other cultures. Very uh, understanding, very uh, inclusive. Um, uh, in uh, this whole uh, uh, effort, uh, they demonstrated a bunch of knowledge about other communities and cultures, a bunch of knowledge about how to collaborate effectively and how to deal with conflicts. But there are other approaches uh, to, um, to cultural differences, um, and uh, this uh, maybe represents them, <laughs> right? <laughs> this is another thing of little kids. You see that girl on the right? She's not happy. <laughs> She's about to launch an attack. <laughs> uh, and this is, a, 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 you know, just very common in cultural issues. Uh, you know, I remember, for example, uh, 10 years ago or so, a, a plane landed in China by mistake, <laughs> an American plane. And there was just a huge extended scandal about it. The Chinese wanted the Americans to apologize for it. The Americans said, no, we can't apologize. That's admitting we did something wrong and we didn't do anything wrong. We just made a mistake. You know, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but uh, you know, just major cultural differences. Uh, in China, of course, shame and apology uh, and the pro uh, well, not pride, uh, respect are really important. Um, and, uh, th they, and th they construct that whole emotion space very differently than we do in the U.S. Uh, okay, so uh, this is a, a little bit of a sense of, uh, of where we're trying to go. Uh, now, uh, the, the, I love that apple up on the right. You see that? That's a, a piece of art. <laughs> um, the, there's a long history to cosmopolitanism. It actually, you know, you can find traces of it in Aristotle, of course because you can find almost everything there. Um, uh, and uh, the central goal, uh, as we see it, is to, uh, and as I think you see it, is to extend students' care to people in all corners of the globe. And now, Anthony Appy has written a bunch about this, even with a book with the title, Cosmopolitanism. Uh, and Christina uh, has written a chapter for uh, the, the new book coming out from uh, OECD called Talking Global, Learning to Read and Speak the World. Um, so, uh, 
uh, a little bit about the brain. Uh, there's a whole lot of garbage out there about the brain. Some of you have heard me say this before. Some of you haven't. Uh, I just want to, you know, the, most of what's, what you hear out there is silly stuff. Uh, it doesn't make any sense in terms of the science. Uh, uh, and uh, so this is a cartoon that kind of illustrates that. Which hemisphere of my brain uh, controls the weather on Long Island, <laughs> right? Uh, 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 now, uh, a whole lot of conversations at cocktail parties are kind of like that. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, so we call these neural myths. Uh, uh, and uh, another word I have for them is brain <laughs> scams. <right>? Uh, <laughs> um, so um, uh, anyway, that's, um, uh, th that's a, w a warning. Uh, uh, the, 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 uh, I'll, I'll just give you one example from, uh, from the radio in Boston. Uh, there's been this long-running ad that goes something like this. Uh, you only use 20% of your brain. Not true. Uh, but we are going to show you with our half an hour program how to use all of your brain. No, 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 no. Nonsense, garbage. How much is Yes, a few hundred dollars, right? Um, so, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but neuroscience is very relevant. Uh, and one of the things that it's done is to give us uh, in education and in neuroscience a much deeper, broader appreciation for how amazingly plastic or flexible the brain is. Even old guys like me uh, end up with our brains changing based on our, uh, our daily experience. So the brain is constantly re rewiring itself. Uh, and uh, uh, that gives us a, the remarkable flexibility that we have as human beings. Uh, you know, uh, contrary to, the, uh, to the, uh, what you might think in reading some of the literature on, on languages, uh, uh, it's not only little kids who can learn to speak another language. Uh, millions of adults are doing it all over the world every day. Uh, and some of them become really good at it, even when they're 50 years old. Um, um, so, uh, so the, the brain is amazingly plastic, uh, and uh, just about every neuroscientist I've ever met, if you ask them, what's the first thing you would say about the brain, they would say it's plastic. <laughs> uh, it's flexible, it rewires itself. Um, uh, and um, uh, one of the things that's helpful for teachers, in my experience, is to understand that when you're trying to get somebody to write an essay that's effective, or to, to understand the perspective of another culture, or to speak a new language, they have to grow a new neural network. They literally have to rewire their brain. And that takes a long time. That's why all these things we teach in school, or so many of them, take a, a long time. That's why we need years for somebody to learn a new language or for somebody to learn how to how to think about, uh, think in terms of the viewpoint of a different culture. Um, uh, so, um, uh, uh, one of the problems in, res uh, in, uh, in education is that uh, despite Dewey's entreaties starting in 1896 to establish research on education, on teaching and learning, it hasn't been done. So even Dewey's own school in Chicago which he founded uh, at the University of Chicago, uh, which still exists, the Dewey Lab School. It, it has not done any research on learning and teaching for decades. Um, so uh, so, so uh, now in most industries, uh, there's a lot of research that gets done, right? In agriculture, we test all the time and uh, it helps us develop great new grains uh, or seeds or uh, growing processes so that we can f uh, feed the whole world. That's one of the reasons we haven't, we don't have billions of people starving. We have many people starving, but we have a lot fewer starving than we thought we were going to have with this population explosion we're in the middle of. Uh, and uh, so, so or the chemical industry, uh, the cosmetics industry, they spend millions every year on face cream and lipstick and perfume. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, we don't do that in education. We do hardly any research in education. 
there's a little bit the National Science Foundation funds based on the Sputnik scare uh, uh, in science and math. Uh, but that's about it. And in most areas, and including many areas of science and math, like there's almost no research on how kids learn chemistry. I'm working with a couple of chemistry professors now who are trying to uh, change that. Um, so uh, traffic safety is another example. We have a great database on traffic safety, and that's, allowed, that's helped us to be able to redesign cars and intersections and highways so that they're much safer. So we end up now when, you know, like I had a, a, a blowout uh, uh, last year, uh, and um, the car was uh, a wreck, but my daughter and I were not bruised or scratched at all. The cars are designed now to protect the people, not the car. <laughs> uh, and that's, a, that's been a, a huge transformation, and it's been based on a whole lot of data. So we should be collecting data like that in education, uh, uh, and we should be having a dialogue where teachers and researchers talk to each other. So that's something we've been trying to establish here. We've tried to establish at several other schools. We now, happily last year, we got a big grant from the uh, Department of Education in Washington. So we're doing a bunch of research now in the Boston public schools uh, 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 on uh, creating new ways of assessing how learning and teaching work in the Boston public schools. Um, so are there questions or comments or thoughts about that? I hope next time there will be, uh, next time I ask for a question. Uh, okay, so one of the best examples of this is Sesame Street. Uh, a few of you have heard me say this before. Forgive me if I'm repeating. But Sesame Street is just a model for this. Uh, they, uh, Gerald Lesser, uh, the author of the third uh, bullet, uh, uh, was uh, a professor at Harvard, and uh, he joined with a business person uh, and Joan Gantz Cooney, uh, the, the showbiz person, uh, and they created Sesame Street uh, back in the, in the uh, 70s. And Sesame Street's been one of the great educational uh, successes, right? Uh, a whole new uh, area of education opened up as a result of Sesame Street. Well, Sesame Street, from the first, the very beginning, was grounded in research. Jerry made sure it was grounded in research. Everything was tested. Uh, so the, the, the uh, kind of a story to just show you how, ba how broad the testing was, they uh, had decided at the beginning that they thought the evidence showed that uh, the children uh, related better to human beings than they did to puppets or, or cartoon characters. So they designed the whole thing at the beginning before they actually started broadcasting to, uh, uh, to, to uh, focus on human interactions. Uh, but there was this guy named Henson, right? <laughs> uh, he was in New York, and he thought that they would, uh, that, that the Muppets could be really helpful uh, in making the program a success. So they agreed that they were gonna test that. Uh, and they brought in uh, uh, characters like Big Bird uh, and, um, uh, you know, Grover and Cookie Monster, uh, and they, uh, they, they tested them out. And you know what happened, right? Uh, the kids related much more easily to the Muppets than they did to the people. <laughs> uh, and so the Muppets became a central part of the program, and they're one of the reasons for its great success and one of the ways it makes lots of money. You know, how many, how many uh, 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 people have... Uh, you know, uh, Grover or Cookie Monster or other uh, characters. Uh, who's the most popular character now? Elmo, Elmo that's right. Uh, you can tell my kids have gotten older, so I don't watch it mu so much anymore. Uh, uh, so, uh, <coughs> so in, in all, the, you know, it's, it's in 50 or 60 countries around the world, including China. <coughs> and, uh, and in every one of those countries, it continues to have a research foundation. They test everything to see what's actually going to work. Um, am amazing how you can be much more effective if you actually test, <laughs> uh, if you actually assess what works and what doesn't work. Um, so, um, so that's a great example. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, happily we've been able to work here now to try to create an assessment uh, uh, based on uh, uh, what, what you all teach. Uh, 
Uh, it's natural uh, in schools, I think, to do research because every school uh, has as a fundamental part of it that uh, the teacher is intervening to try to help a student learn. Right? So you, all, you have automatically an intervention and then the teacher assesses, uh, sometimes intuitively, sometimes with standardized tests, to see what the students have actually learned. So you have an intervention and assessment, intervention and assessment every day in the classroom. That means we ought to be, I mean, it's a natural for doing research. Uh, uh, and we ought to be doing that. Uh, and happily, we are uh, doing it here now and with several other schools. Um, so uh, uh, an issue that, that's uh, essential for today and for this whole uh, approach that we're talking about here that you all take to, to, uh, to, to cultural differences and cultural issues uh, is uh, the centrality of culture. And so this is a cartoon from Bruno de la Chiesa, who some of you have met, uh, uh, in which uh, uh, there's a, a massive mistake that uh, advertisers made in Egypt uh, when they were uh, designing uh, a, a cartoon. So uh, which direction do you read uh, if you're reading uh, Arabic, right? You go right to left. But if you're reading English, you go left to right, right? So uh, this is what the um, advertisers created. Um, um, <laughs> you, you see the problem? <laughs> uh, you take this pill and it makes you sick. Uh, as opposed to the, what they intended, which was that you take the pill and it makes you well. So this is the, the correct version. Uh, and um, uh, 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 I mean, this is, yeah, this is the version that they showed, uh, which is not the correct version. Uh, it should have been switched, OK? Uh, so we have to pay attention to cultural uh, differences. This is just a really blatant example uh, of, uh, of very embarrassed advertisers. Um, um, so, uh, so broadly speaking, the approach we're taking is to look at, uh, at learning as something that requires skills. That means it's affected by context, it's affected by practice, uh, uh, and, and it grows uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, the kind of discontinuities that Ralph likes to talk about. It grows in spurts, it grows in jumps, it doesn't grow in a linear way. So some, you know, some of you have heard me talk about this before. Uh, the uh, the uh, fundamental growth model for learning is a logistic growth. So it's S-shaped growth. It's not the, um, the kind of growth, uh, the linear growth that you see in the pediatrician's office. You go into the pediatrician's office, you see this growth curve. It seems to say that, the, you know, the, uh, that height and weight grow in a very linear way. Well, that only comes because you've averaged across kids. If you look at actual individual kids, they show growth spurts. Uh, in fact, there's even research in lambs that shows that you get growth spurts uh, in the lambs when they're asleep. Uh, uh, and, you know, they actually put sensors on the growth points of the bones. And they showed that the lambs uh, actually have growth spurts at night when they're asleep in, on a few days, a few nights. Uh, and uh, most of the time, they don't. But, but the, so even in lambs, the growth is occurring in spurts. It's not occurring in any kind of linear way. Um, OK, so this is an example of one of the spurts. Uh, this is from a study in the Netherlands. Uh, uh, and uh, this is one boy. Uh, generally, if you look at individual growth, you get a much better uh, indicator of what the growth is actually like. If you average across kids, you end up with average curves. And the average curves generally don't match any kid. <laughs> uh, no kid shows the kind of linear growth that you see in the average curves. Uh, so, but, but this is the kind of growth that you see. So here you have this boy who's learning to use personal pronouns in Dutch. Uh, and right at about two years of age, he shows a huge spurt. Uh, uh, if you look at other aspects of language, he would have shown the spurt two months earlier or three months later. Uh, there's a window of about a year when the kids are, uh, are just surging forth with language. You know, it's, it's so exciting. If I'm, uh, probably some of you have uh, kids right in that age range right now. It's, it's just, you know, they are learning like 12 or 15 words a day. 
it's just, it, it's phenomenal to see. Uh, uh, it's really exciting uh, time for them and for, for their parents. Okay. Uh, so we get those kinds of spurts all the time in development, and we use those spurts as an index to figure out how learning uh, is, is accumulating over time. Uh, and we find that there's a series of clusters of spurts, uh, and, and that creates a developmental scale. So I'm going to illustrate this for you with the critical thinking uh, study, uh, so-called reflective judgment, as John Dewey defined it. This is a, a study that we did uh, of, uh, uh, with Karen Kitchener in uh, Denver, who was a colleague. Um, uh, of, uh, of uh, the stages of reflective judgment that John Dewey described originally in a global way and that Kitchener and King uh, spelled out in great detail. They showed that there are seven stages of reflective judgment uh, and that uh, you, you can uh, characterize each of them individually and each of them goes through a spurt at a particular age period uh, when you look at uh, optimal performance. Uh, you know, uh, I'm not going to talk much about that, but, uh, but just a little bit about what optimal means. Optimal means it's basically supported uh, uh, by the context. So this is the gist of a stage six argument, that although knowledge is uncertain, you can make strong and justify conclusions across domains and viewpoints by marshalling evidence and argument. Um, and um, uh, this is, so that's the next to last stage. Uh, this is uh, an example of what, what the students showed between 14 and 28 years of age in our study. Uh, when we just asked them, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, okay, here is an argument that chemical additives to food are harmful for you. And here's another argument that chemical additives to food protect you from food poisoning. Uh, so uh, wh what do you think? <laughs> okay, they're both true, right? Uh, and. Um, uh, so, so we get uh, that kind of an argument from them, and when we, when we ask them just like that, uh, this is the kind of growth curve we get. You see how it's S-shaped? Uh, that's the normal growth curve. So uh, this is what we get when we, when we show them a good answer and ask them to explain it to us. So uh, y you know, you've all probably experienced this. When you, you put kids in a, a situation where you've helped them uh, understand something. Uh, and for a few minutes, they can sustain a good argument. Uh, but 10 minutes later, 20 minutes later, they can't repeat it. It falls apart very quickly. Uh, this happens to adults, too. It happens to me all the time. <laughs> you know, uh, we uh, also are subject to uh, a supported argument versus a non-supported argument. And uh, so here we've got uh, you see what happens with the growth curve when you look at the supported uh, condition? You have two successive spurts. Uh, that kind of growth curve where you have a jump with a small drop and then a jump and then a small drop and then a jump and then a small drop, that's the way cognitive development occurs naturally. Uh, we've shown that now in a, a bunch of different studies. Um, so uh, th uh, this is what uh, uh, demonstrates stage six arguments this red line, uh, notice when they first get stage six arguments uh, at about 20 years of age, they only get up to about 50% correct. Uh, uh, how long does it take them to uh, get uh, up to near 100% correct? Um, about five more years. Uh, this is a demonstration of a point that we, uh, we summarize by saying learning takes a while. <laughs> okay, uh, when you're trying to do complex things like making an argument about what you know, epistemology, right? Uh, it's, it's tough and it takes uh, years to get it so you can really do it in most, uh, for most content. Uh, uh, so we don't just learn something, we, uh, we, we learn it in a range. Uh, when we're supported uh, in making a sophisticated argument, we can Come, move up to a higher level, and we can sustain that for a few minutes, but it quickly falls apart when we don't have that support. Was there a hand? Yes? I was wondering about uh, how attitude um, builds in this. In other words, uh -huh. for a young child who is experiencing a lot of growth, they're encouraged. Yes. Then it stops, and they're mm -hmm. discouraged. And yes. And, and presumably, is that, how 
Oh, yeah, that's, that's really important. Uh, it's one of the, uh, we're actually doing some research at, at another school we work with on, uh, on what gets kids engaged in learning. And so it's kind of uh, relevant to that, actually. And Marcelo and Carola Suarez Orozco studied engagement also in immigrant children. So, uh, you know, uh, the best, uh, th there are two very strong predictors of uh, uh, school performance in immigrant children. One is uh, language facility. <laughs> in, this, in the language of instruction, English in most, you know, in most cases in the U.S. The other one is what? Engagement. It's exactly that. It's the, you know, how much do they, uh, do they really see school as relevant, as interesting, as worth working on? Uh, and, uh, you know, I have four kids. Uh, my fourth one uh, is uh, really convinced that school is boring and that he d shouldn't have anything to do with it. Uh, it's quite a challenge. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. when, when kids take off a few months from school, right. summer, summertime, yes. does that affect, I mean, we know that yeah. intuitively, but... There's a fair amount of research on it, and uh, performance definitely goes down yeah. over the summer months. Of retaining, right. Even the summer months. That's right. And, of course, retention is a big problem. Uh, so uh, uh, there, there are actually f so several papers that came out recently uh, looking at long-term evidence for retention. And... Uh, you know, uh, basically, if you don't stay engaged with the material, you lose a lot of your knowledge. Uh, yes? You lay that, you lay that over a certain number of years. Yes. Isn't there a, a, a large difference between the development of different kids? So oh, absolutely. You can't uh, really say ninth grade, full. No, no, you can't. Uh, uh, you're absolutely right. I really appreciate you pointing that out. It's really, uh, th there's enormous variability. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and if we don't, actually it's one of the things we obsess about in the Mind-Brain Education Program at Harvard. Uh, you know, every one of our courses is, starts off with the idea, you know, kids are really different. <laughs> uh, and if you, if you want to teach them effectively, you need to figure out how to engage them. Um, uh, and so, uh, so that's, uh, uh, you, you know, this is uh, an area where, uh, where uh, presumably there's enough instruction that they're kind of all in the same ballpark. Uh, plus, none of these kids, or most of these kids were pretty motivated kids, right? They, you know, they volunteered for a study. <laughs> uh, so, um, so they're not uh, every, everybody's kids. Uh, but kids really differ in what they're interested in. And uh, one of the things we need to do as teachers, a uh, huge challenge for the 21st century, is to figure out how to uh, engage all the kids. So, you know, uh, historically schools have been really good with maybe 20%, 25% of the kids. Uh, and then the other 75% went off to do, be farmers or do something else, uh, you know, uh, which was really important for the society, but where they didn't uh, need the kind of book skill um, that, um, uh, th that's, uh, tr that schools teach. Uh, so it ends up with, um, with 75% a, a, a of the people not learning effectively. And the, a big study came out of just a few years ago uh, from the National Academy of Sciences um, saying uh, essentially we are failing most of our student population in helping students learn how to learn from what they read. So we, we get them so they can learn to read in the sense they can read dog and chair, <laughs> single words. But then we have to get them to the point that they can learn from what they read. Uh, and uh, most, uh, uh, most of, for most of our children, we fail. But, uh, you know, like 75% of the kids in the US do not learn how to uh, learn effectively from what they read. Um, it's, a, it's a real catastrophe. OK. So would that be? Uh, individual differences, or is it just also, you know, a certain student um, may not really get that development until five years, ten okay, years after okay, everyone okay. else? Or, we, or are you talking about, well, they'll never, this group will never get okay. it? Okay, we can be sure that there are going to be individual differences in how they develop. Uh, but uh, in our tests so far, Generally, there's an age range where they're developed, where mo virtually all the kids are developing a new way of thinking. 
uh, and, but they only apply it in the areas that they're interested in. Um, so, uh, so for each kid, you're going to have them, the, I mean, you know, like uh, my son loves football and rugby, right? Uh, so he's quite good at thinking about football and rugby and is quite good at thinking about how to find his friends when they're lost in Boston. <laughs> uh, but he's not very good uh, at uh, uh, working with an English teacher to try to understand Hamlet. Uh, because he says, that's crap, I don't want to do that. <laughs> um, you know, so, so that's, uh, you know, that's what we're faced with with I think most of our students, that they don't uh, engage. Yes? I'm wondering if these studies have differentiated with male and female students? Uh-huh. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, that's a big question, isn't it? Uh, what, uh, the evidence around the world these days uh, is pointing to the, uh, a general effect that we're doing much better with girls than we are with boys. Uh, uh, and uh, that seems to be true in most countries. Uh, uh, and, um, uh, you know, uh, we're, uh, people are, are really uh, kind of confused about it and debating about it. Uh, uh, I think uh, 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 somehow or other school has become, well, think about the kinds of behaviors you have to do in school, okay? Uh, this is a little bit stereo sexist stereotyping, but. Uh, uh, but you know, you, you uh, uh, my, my, my son, who I've been talking about, Lucas, is um, when he was in kindergarten, he couldn't sit in a chair for more than two minutes. Uh, uh, and uh, his teachers uh, recognized that. She was a great kindergarten teacher. She said, uh, she said to us, you know, Lucas can't sit in a chair for more than two minutes, but that's okay. We can handle it, you know? <laughs> uh, uh, but, but you know, th then when you get to be in 10th grade, or 11th grade, and you have to, uh, and you have that same problem, uh, then it's it's much uh, much more serious. And so I think the way uh, schools are designed uh, probably is um, uh, makes it makes it easier for girls to connect to it. Uh, but we have to always remember that girls are really different from each other, and boys are really different from each other. So uh, you know, um, uh, my uh, my wife Jane is quite, uh, uh, shall we say, active. <laughs> uh, in fact, she was diagnosed as an adult with hyperactivity uh, disorder, you know, uh, uh, and, uh, and so uh, she, um, you know, she has trouble sitting still, uh, you know, but somehow or other she still did really well in school. Uh, she could engage with the, the material in school, and so she, she, uh, she could get around that, uh, that fidgetiness that, was the, that gets a lot of, the, of kids in trouble. So uh, that's my best guess about why there's a big gender difference across cultures, but we really don't know. And I think it's one of the central issues we need to work on is how to get more boys engaged. Now, we also need to get more girls engaged. Uh, yeah. well, um, recent uh, brain research has shown that there's different timing in the development of the frontal lobes that right, males right. tend to develop that part of the brain later, like around 30. Where the females are around 22. Uh, I don't know anything is that about. A, is that a brain scam? Uh, who, who, who is uh, who's the researcher? I can get it to you. They've, they've talked about the frontal lobe. I'm sorry. Did you say the name? I don't remember the oh, name. You don't I'll remember get the it name. to you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's not true. Uh -huh. uh, 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 it is true that uh, okay. So if you just look at the averages, uh, at around 15 uh, to 20, you have uh, uh, kids showing a big growth in. Uh, in connections between the frontal lobes and the limbic system, which is the system that regulates emotion. Uh, and you see uh, more of that in girls than you do in boys. Um, and then again in the 40s, you see another surge of it, according to Francine Bennis, uh, uh, who's a neuroscientist at Harvard. And she, uh, so she finds that in the 40s, you see another surge of it, and it's stronger in men than in women. Uh, but the men start behind. <laughs> so if you look at myelination, that's the efficient connections between the prefrontal cortex and the limbic system. Uh, you get uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the men have less myelination when they're in their 40s. Uh, and, and by the time they're 50, they have m a lot more. Uh, and the women have some growth in myelin too, but it's not as dramatic as it, as it is for the men. Uh, but that's in the 40s, not in the 20s. Okay. Um, uh, yes. Um, so I'm thinking about how you said we're failing or most of our students are not able to read to learn. Mm -hmm. um, we're teaching them 
to learn to read, but then right. the, the comprehension on the yep. back side of it. Yep. So I'm thinking about the comment you made about it takes approximately five years right. to solidify a new skill. Right. So if we start to teach our children to read around the age of six, mm -hmm. five years they master right. reading around the age of 11, right. 12. Um, right. So then you think, okay, at that point, now we're teaching them to read to learn. Right. So again, another five years. So right. now we're into the um, 16, 17 range. Right. And within a year of that, <laughs> we're done, out of, right. out of school. So I'm wondering the longevity of these studies, if that ever shows, um, as these students become adults, if they ever master the skill of reading to learn. Because mm -hmm. I, I agree that a lot of students struggle with the comprehension right. part, yep. but then as I, I, I don't know the research, but I disagree that adults are not able, that, that majority right. of adults are not able to uh, uh, yeah, read that, to learn. That's a really good uh, argument. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, learning never stops, uh, and a, a whole lot of adults become very skilled readers, and including, I mean, like, uh, we've done a fair amount of research on dyslexic adults. Uh, so, like, one of my best friends is a professor at Penn, uh, and uh, he, um, uh, uh, actually, some, some one of you knows him very well, <laughs> Jan, uh, uh, but, uh, and he, he didn't learn to read until he was about 14, uh, by his own uh, dis, uh, description of when he learned to read, uh, and uh, so it, it turns out that there are a whole lot of dyslexic kids who have a lot of difficulty learning to read, who, uh, who show a, a big breakthrough when they're about 12 to 15. Uh, um, uh, we, we have done a couple of research projects on it. So, and we, we, uh, so uh, a majority of, dyslex of very successful dyslexic adults that we interviewed, uh, Rosalie Fink interviewed in, in her dissertation work, uh, uh, described that they actually finally learned to read when they were 12 to 15. Uh, so there's a whole lot of stuff like that that goes on. Uh, and learning never stops. Uh, uh, that's one of the lessons of neuroscience, uh, uh, and uh, uh, you know. So I, uh, you're absolutely right in uh, the way I was saying it was too simple. Uh, that there are lots of adults who are continuing to learn, and a number of them become skilled readers who had no clue that they would ever become skilled readers when they were when they were ten. Yes. Right. That's right. Yeah, you've really hit uh, an important nail on the head. Uh, uh, that's a really uh, big question, and um, uh, and also uh, a, a part of it is that we need to stop thinking about reading to learn as something that's the same in all domains. Uh, if you're uh, one of my doctoral students is really into philosophy, uh, you know, so you start talking to him about Dewey or or Peirce. Uh, or James, and he, he just is, is so impressive with his knowledge. But, you know, but you start talking to him about raising flowers, uh, uh, you know, or, or, or agriculture, and he doesn't know what he's doing. Uh, now, that's, uh, uh, that's typical of all of us. Uh, well, you know, we have areas of expertise where we're really skilled and, uh, and, and where, we, where we can learn uh, easily, and then uh, other areas where it's really hard for us to learn. Actually, one of my... Uh, I, this connects back to the whole point about um, about um, uh, motivation uh, and engagement. Uh, we have a, a boy who uh, came into a study we were doing, uh, doing a brain uh, imaging uh, assessment to see whether uh, learning to read changed the way his brain functioned. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, the study was a was a, a, a total failure. Uh, we didn't find any evidence for. Uh, that the brain measures were helpful at all. The, uh, some other studies do find them to be helpful. Uh, but but this, what, this one case came out of this, uh, which was just really a, a wonderful case. Th there's this boy whose parents come into us and they say, oh, my son, he just, uh, 
he just uh, is obsessed with lawnmowers. Uh, uh, and uh, I, I can't get him to, uh, to read uh, the book that his teacher assigns in third grade. But, uh, uh, but, but uh, uh, you know, uh, he keeps trying to get the lawnmower manual. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I find him uh, under, uh, under the covers at night with a flashlight reading the lawnmower manual. So, you know, what, what do you think our advice was to him? Let him read the lawnmower manual. What you need to do is to have him read. It doesn't matter if it's the lawnmower manual or, or the book in school. Uh, if, if he's going to read the lawnmower manual, let him do it. Uh, he'll learn to read. And they, so they came to us at the end, and they said, thank you. you your, your study made such a big difference. Our son is finally able to read. And we said, it has nothing to do with the, uh, the brain measures we were doing or the brain uh, drilling we were doing. It has to do with the fact that you let him read the lawnmower manual. Uh, so that's a, uh, you know, th that's a really important lesson, that you, you need to find where the kid's engaged. And there, they're willing to read. And this is what we found in the study with all the dyslexic adults who are so successful. They all, had, uh, they all reported that they were obsessed with some topic. For a bunch of them, it was Civil War history. Some others, it was aeronautics, you know, or lawnmowers. Uh, uh, and, uh, and they... Uh, they, so they read in that area, uh, uh, and, uh, and they were willing to put in a huge amount of work because they were so interested in the Civil War that they just had to find ways of getting information about it. And the, uh, and the major uh, sources were books, so that meant they had to learn to read. Uh, and th this is what my friend at Penn did, too. Uh, you know, he, uh, he uh, uh, re uh, you know, eventually learned to read when he was about 15. Uh, through uh, major efforts uh, to, to, um, uh, uh, to get him engaged uh, in, in reading uh, uh, books that he was really interested in. Uh, yes? So in this discussion, I guess the main goal is kind of taking from this mm -hmm. to be more or less that instead of guiding students to the information and giving them the information, providing them the information, and then letting them find their way through reading it on their own, right. rather it should be to inspire them to invest in the information on their own. So ah. it's more about inspiration and making it so they invest in it, right. rather than guiding them to the information and I don't want to say that, the, that those are contrasts. I don't yeah. want to say that we shouldn't be doing the first one. Uh -huh. uh, I, I would rather say we should be doing the second one also. Okay, uh, okay. so uh, it, uh, teachers are wonderful guides. and. Uh, 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 you know, in my experience with my kids, if the kid is engaged with the teacher, if they like the teacher, if they respect the teacher, then the, uh, they learn a great deal from that teacher. If they hate the teacher, like my, my, my younger son has this tendency to say, oh, she's terrible, I don't want to have anything to do with her, I'm not going to learn from her. Uh, <laughs> you know, then of course they're not going to learn anything. So, uh, so you need to have, uh, uh, to be paying attention to the relationship with, with the teacher. Uh, uh, and that's, uh, you know, I, I, I know here that that happens a lot, and I think that's one of the things that makes uh, this such a good school. Mm -hmm. Yes? So going back to the learning in spurts, mm -hmm. not linear, what does that mean that we should be assessing them often? I mean, uh, because uh, can you bring some more quickly? <laughs> okay. Uh, we should be, I'm sorry, I, I, I'll try to remind people. Uh, um, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, it, it does mean that, uh, Growth is happening all the time, uh, and it, it certainly means that we should be assessing more regularly. We're creating assessments. As, uh, 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 I should move on, so we'll move on to talk about some of those, where, uh, uh, where you can actually do an assessment in the classroom uh, based on what the student is saying and, uh, and what they're writing and what they're doing. Um, and uh, and that, uh, then you can actually see how the learning is happening in the learning environment. Uh, and then assessment, uh, uh, if, we, if our system is a success, we will be able to assess kids uh, all the time in the classroom uh, or, uh, uh, or based on what they write or what they say. So uh, at Harvard, we're already doing this. Uh, we have uh, uh, students write essays. Uh, you know, uh, in one course, they might write five or six essays uh, over the course of a semester. Uh, and then we can actually code those essays in terms of their, their understanding. Uh, and uh, 
So, uh, so it, it, that makes it easy for us because we're, they're already writing. We can use their writing to assess their understanding. Uh, uh, it's harder to do in the low grades. Uh, I should move on. So, um, so this is um, this is the overall uh, curve for the reflective judgment study. You can see that uh, the the, the S-shaped growth that I talked about, successive S-shaped growth curves, uh, is very common in uh, cognitive assessments like this. Um, okay, so. Um, so this uh, shows you that it also applies uh, to, um, to, uh, to a, uh, tests. So these are, uh, uh, this is a huge sample of about 1,000 or 747 people uh, uh, on uh, assessing them on uh, successive levels of skill, uh, starting with the, uh, the simplest representations, ending with very complex abstract principles. Uh, and uh, as you can see from this graph, uh, uh, every uh, time there's a new a level emerging, there's a, uh, there's a kind of a cluster of uh, people performing at that level. So, uh, so this uh, uh, illustrates that even from tests, like standardized tests, or in this case, it's a standardized moral interview, uh, you can get, uh, uh, you, you can test whether uh, you have this series of levels of skill that we've uh, found in, uh, in our research, uh, and, and it, it, they keep showing up everywhere. It's amazing to us how robust it is. Can yes? Can go back to the three stages? Uh, because in designing the spiral curriculum, this I used, one? Yeah. Uh, where it said in the corner uh, three stages of right. growth, uh, you had a, a, another pop up window on the right hand that came up. Anyway. Uh, because in, in Th this one? No, no, it was another one. It was on. It was on the far right pop up. It said three stages. Right. That there one. we go. Okay. Okay. Because in the spiral curriculum, uh, I designed it so we right. have formative, dominant, and climactic right. going over e a pulse of years that are right. subdivisions of yep. the unfoldment of the spiral. Right. Which also is isomorphic to Steiner's Waldorf system of will. Mm -hmm. uh, reasoning and um, right. feeling. Right. Uh, so it's kind of, uh, it interests me that this structure is occurring in the cognitive process as well. Yes, right. Uh, uh, you know, we've, we find it everywhere when we, uh, when we look correctly. Uh, you have to actually look at specific skills. You can't just take a, an average measure because then you've averaged everything out. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So, um, okay, so there are 10 skill levels. Uh, they, they start out with actions. Uh, they move to representations, then they move to abstractions. Uh, uh, for each cycle, there are four levels. And as we all know, this is an old joke for me, three times 12 equals 10. Right? <laughs> uh, because the last level of, uh, of, of actions is the first level of representations. The last level of representations is the first level of abstractions. So, uh, so you end up with uh, 10 levels uh, because when you build really complex action systems, that becomes a representation. So in kids' language, like when they say, mommy, eat ice cream, okay, that's a, uh, that's a simple sentence, which is a representation of what mommy's doing. Uh, if, they, if they play, uh, doll walk across the table, okay, uh, that's, a, again, a, another way of representing an action of another person. So, um, so the, uh, that involves a complex action, set of action systems that are coordinated to form a representation. That's a real quick uh, tutorial on, uh, on how, uh, how uh, complex actions build up to representations, complex representations build up to abstractions. Um, okay, uh, and this is another way of doing it. This gives you a sense of the range of variation. This is the optimal level, the one with support, uh, which is much more stable in our research. Uh, functional level is much more variable. That's the ordinary performance. Uh, what you do when you're not given support, uh, and, and you know, it varies a whole lot. So when, when we're an adult and we're capable of abstract systems and principles down here, uh, that doesn't mean that we use them most of the time. In order to be able to use them on our own without the help of a teacher 
or a textbook uh, to prime the key concepts, uh, it takes many, many more years for us to be able to do that. So learning uh, isn't just uh, you get it and then you've got it. Uh, you, you get it a little bit and you have a sense of where your learning needs to go. Uh, that this is what happens with the priming situation, with the situation where you're showing optimal performance, uh, but then you need to actually get there. You need to be able to do that understanding, to demonstrate that understanding, to show a performance of understanding that, uh, that, uh, uh, that um, uh, reflects the more complicated coordination of uh, concepts that you need to do. Is that okay? Maybe too complicated. Um, uh, so, uh, so tests can, uh, can support and promote learning, uh, and we've been creating uh, now, uh, uh, it's a, there's a team of us, but the primary characters are uh, uh, Theo Dawson, uh, uh, Zachary Stein, uh, uh, Christina Hinton, and me, uh, and um, a, a, another group of students that are also working with them. Uh, and with these uh, methods, using the skill scale, we can create standardized tests uh, that have the same properties as the as the uh, like the PISA tests, or you know the ones uh, out of uh, OECD, or the uh, No Child Left Behind tests, uh, um, and uh, uh, you know. But they ha also have additional properties, which include that they uh, reflect what is happening in the classroom, uh, and they can actually directly assess what's happening in the classroom. So. Uh, so we want to naturalize assessment. Uh, teachers do natural assessments all the time uh, when they're trying to figure out whether, uh, whether Susie just understood what they were saying when they were describing what arithmetic is uh, or what, uh, how addition works or how multiplication works. Uh, okay, uh, so, so, so we're creating these tests that are based on what students say. And I'm gonna describe the study that we did here uh, uh, as a kind of a uh, introduction to what these methods are. So uh, here the curriculum starts with cultural history uh, and students learn about uh, a wide range of topics uh, reflecting the uh, presumed evolution of human culture. Uh, and uh, the arts are integrated fully into the curriculum. I think that's one of the best things about this place uh, because uh, the, you know, the arts give you a whole bunch of ways of engaging uh, students. Uh, my son, who's, uh, who's not, not been getting engaged with school, uh, went to a, a, a summer camp where he had to do a song and dance performance. <laughs> and of course, uh, he didn't, wasn't interested in doing that at all, but it was a requirement. Uh, and he ended up doing a terrific job and really enjoying himself. He even sort of admits that he enjoyed it. <laughs> um, Anyway, so that it's great to have those sorts of things available. So in the, the toolkit, we create, uh, we, we connect two key methods. One is a grounded theory and another one is the skill complexity. So I just talked about the skill scale, uh, this, uh, this scale here. Uh, uh, but uh, in addition to that, we, we ground uh, the um, analysis in the categories that the kids use. So we, we get, uh, you know, a couple, uh, ideally we have a couple of hundred interviews uh, and we ask the kids um, to, um, uh, I mean, no, we, we look at the interviews and we, uh, we have a set of coders who figure out what the categories are that need to be used to fit this, uh, this set of responses that the kids have made. So I'll, I can give you an example of that in a minute here. So, uh, here are some of the interview questions, so you have a sense of that first. Does one community ever have a right to tell another community what's best for them? This is from our interview. What's the same and different about people around the world? How do you think your Ross School education influenced the way you think about contemporary global issues? How does Ross prepare you to be a member of the global community or of a global community? Um, so uh, here are a couple of, uh, of, of quotations and, and then I'll I can go on and show you more. Uh, uh, our culture borrows so much from other cultures' history and we need to be respectful and grateful for that. This is what one of your students said. <laughs> uh, uh, we don't rule the earth, it's a big place. There's so many other people besides Americans. Uh, you know, uh, uh, there's so many quotes like this that are really impressive. Uh, what is a community? 
Uh, this was an alumnus. Uh, our sense of evolution is that it has to be the same people, the same color, or the same religion, but I think that idea has to change because it brings a lot of conflict. Uh, the way the world is today, I would define the notion of community as people with same interests or same values, regardless of gender or culture or religion. That's incredibly wise. <laughs> Uh, we got a lot of responses then. So then if we move on to the next uh, 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 categories, learning about other cultures leads to seeing how you are like others. This is something that we, all, we, we get uh, merging with single abstractions, uh, and we don't see it uh, continuing uh, at the higher levels, just there. Uh, and then uh, 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 people have similar or different values. We see that for single abstractions and abstract mappings. So, so for each of these categories, sometimes they are, are distinctive to one level, sometimes they occur across two or three levels. Uh, 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 in general, they, they help us, they capture the similarities and differences across kids uh, as they're building their understanding. So if I go on a little bit more, learning about other cultures can lead to cooperating. That doesn't happen until they can relate one abstraction to another. We call it an abstract mapping. That's about 15 years of age. Um, uh, and then it continues uh, beyond that. Uh, learning about other cultures can lead to seeing similar feelings. Uh, feelings are uh, really important to talk about. Uh, and then for the, uh, the highest level on this uh, scale, uh, learning about other cultures can lead to seeing similar interests Learning about other cultures can lead to seeing global, local connections. That doesn't happen until the kids are around uh, 20. So the alumni were showing that. Okay. So does that give you a little bit of an intuitive sense for how we set up the categories? Uh, always based on people are just reading the transcripts and then they say, now what category do we need to, for this response? And what category do we need for this other response? And they just, a, a, a small group of people sit together and talk about it and come up with a uh, set of categories that they agree on. So it's qu uh, a standard kind of qualitative method. Any comments or thoughts? Okay. Um, so, uh, so this is uh, a sequence for cosmopolitan thinking, as we call it. Level uh, six to nine. Uh, I'm going to show you three different domains. One is community. Uh, how they talk about community. A second one is conflict resolution. How do they deal with communities in conflict? A third one is global consciousness. Uh, you know, we're, we're trying to look at, at some of these in the big Boston study that I mentioned earlier. So for example, for conflict resolution, we have a dilemma in the Boston study in which uh, uh, the story is that there are these two communities that live in the mountains and they both discovered diamonds. And now there's this issue about who do the diamonds belong to? And so they have to deal with uh, uh, conflict between their interests and their claims. Okay, so for global consciousness, this is uh, starting from the bottom up. We're doing uh, growth the way a plant does here. So uh, uh, at the concrete version is uh, you know about what people in different places do, have, or like. So uh, yeah, and uh, you know in, in in Egypt they speak Arabic uh, and they and they read uh, uh, backwards, uh, right to left. Uh, and, uh, you know, they, they really like uh, 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 certain kinds of food that we don't usually eat in, uh, uh, in, in Boston or in, um, in Idaho. Um, and uh, so, so they're, it's very concrete representations of how people are different. Then here, for single abstractions, they understand how people in other cultures live, feel, and think. So they start making generalizations, uh, you know, uh, uh, that are that go beyond. Yeah, they speak a different language. Uh, they they become uh, um, abstract descriptions of what the, how the people differ. And then here, uh, they uh, for uh, mappings, they understand the effects of the culture on how people live, interact, feel, or think. So, in other words, they have a concept of culture and a concept of the people's ca uh, behavior, and they connect them to each other. So that's much harder, and that doesn't develop until you're about 15. The ability to make those connections. Um, uh, and then uh, for the highest category, uh, you, uh, uh, in this study, uh, they understand the complexity of cultures, their history, and their interactions. So you know that, that last statement that I showed you for, uh, uh, was an example of that sort of thing from one of the alumni. 
Uh, so uh, thoughts or questions about that? Mm -hmm. I'm surprised that you're not finding that earlier. I remember uh, when I was on the fifth grade team, right. Barbara Rader very masterfully um, encouraged discussion. Mm -hmm. I remember specifically a beautiful time uh, where Scott Chasky over at his farm um, had a talk with the kids about what it means to eat locally. And mm -hmm. the kids were very able to go off on many different right. ways of, of explaining to him, the right. farmer, why this was a good idea right, right. and um, how it Th saved these were third on graders energy. Or what? Pardon? Fifth graders? Yes, okay. fifth graders. And uh -huh. they also could then relate it to what they had learned about early civilizations in Mesopotamia. Right, right. And so yeah. it, it, I f okay. it, what, am, what am I missing? Well, you have to get <laughs> out of your way of categorizing them and think about the way they would be categorized in terms of skill. So uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, kids routinely do things that an adult will understand as coordination. So this is an issue for teachers all the time. Say you're, uh, you ask a kid, how does addition relate to subtraction? Okay, they say to you, well, uh, hmm, uh, 4 plus 8 equals 12, and 12 minus 4 equals 8, so that's how they relate to each other. Now, that's a concrete answer. That's not an abstraction that says anything about the operations of addition and subtraction. To, get, to, to give a, a, a more uh, uh, abstract uh, description, they need to say something like, well, addition involves putting numbers together to get a bigger number, but subtraction involves taking them apart to get a smaller number, given positive whole numbers. Okay. So, uh, so that's, uh, uh, there's a contrast. That they're, they're the opposite of each other. That's a, that's a, a mapping of abstract concepts. So, Everything that we do, uh, we can teach in a concrete version. Actually, Bruner said something like this right, a long time ago. He said, in any domain, you can, teach, you can figure out how to teach something that's relevant, even to little kids. <laughs> and you know, that's completely true. But, uh, and that will then build up their knowledge so that they can, uh, uh, can create more abstract concepts later on. So uh, for example, in our, some of our uh, studies, we're able now with the large samples we have been able to accumulate to, to, uh, to look at how uh, likely a student is to be able to move to a higher level of thinking uh, based on how many uh, responses they already show at the lower level. Uh, and uh, you know, it, uh, when, when a kid only has three or four responses uh, at, a, at, say, uh, at single abstractions, then they, ca they, they, not, they never show uh, abstract mappings. They have to have like 15 or 20 uh, responses at the lower level, and then they, they can coordinate them to get to the higher level. So in other words, uh, you, uh, you know, the, your intuitions uh, are likely to get you into trouble uh, when it comes to skill coding, because uh, the, uh, the criteria are pretty strict that they have to actually demonstrate uh, like in this case, a coordination of abstract understanding uh, in order to, um, uh, to show how, that they understand how one math operation relates to another. Does that help? <laughs> uh, so, uh, so you're into, uh, you know, I, I think your intuitions are, are, are good and helpful as a teacher, but you have to be careful about uh, assuming that the child can uh, understand a complicated abstraction just because they can say something that's relevant to your, uh, to your question. Mm -hmm. uh, another qu question? Yes. Uh, was it at level eight, um, when mm -hmm. they understand the effects of culture, did you say that emerges around the age of 15? Um, uh, yes, uh, that emerges around the age of 15, right. I was just wondering if um, there might be a correlation with the uh, opportunity to travel for M-term, uh, seeing as how this for is a sample of Ross students where they, right, right. they get more right. opportunities to see interactions uh, yeah. that kind of bring theory to life. I would expect that to have a big effect, uh, but, uh, but the data we have on it are, are go way beyond Ross. So. Uh, so we have evidence that that emerges at around 13 to 16, 
uh, across many different domains and many different studies. Talking about just your interviews with Ross students at this point? Uh, that's, what we're, that's what this focus is, right? Okay. right. Uh, yes? Another isomorphism that strikes me is that our curriculum starts with elements and then moves to patterns, to systems, and then all the way up in adolescence with the formation of the, you know, the brain myth of the frontal lobes developing late mm -hmm. with adolescence right. is when they have the abstract mastering systems of the recapitulation of the five artistic mathematical mentality. So mm -hmm. the, the spiral is, uh, maps onto this, your uh, pattern exactly. Mm -hmm. Right, right, good. Uh, I wonder if, uh, you know, maybe this one would connect too. Conflict resolution. Here uh, uh, the, they talk about requiring discussion and listening and safety and trust. Here they talk about you have to take other people's perspectives and relate them to each other. Uh, uh, here uh, you, they talk about uh, that you have to be open and uh, transparent uh, uh, in order to get uh, the kind of learning that you need to be able to deal with conflicts. Uh, so you see how, uh, I hope it's at least intuitive, how that gets more and more abstract. Um, yeah? That, that we didn't see any in this sample. Really? Right. Okay. Even though we had some fourth graders, uh, we didn't see it. Uh, by fourth grade, uh, the beginnings of abstractions are happening. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, well, we, were, we asked for a representative sample of your students, but I always suspected that we got a, a biased sample towards the... <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't you. It wasn't you. No, no. It was uh, you know Sally was p picking the the, the 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 subjects and she's gone, so we can blame her. <laughs> so this is the third uh, one on community. A, gr a community is a group of people who share ideas, interests, cooperation, and trust, and so forth. Uh, or a group, of, it's a group of people with a shared history in which members experience acceptance, understanding, and comfort. So it's much more relational there, right? Uh, and then, uh, oops, uh, well, I, I, I'm sorry, I, uh, I just added the three, but that, the, the most abstract we got for community was it's a self-organizing entity that influences the development and behavior of its members, right? That's a very uh, abstract concept. Uh, and, and a powerful one that's essential if you're going to think uh, to, to have a strong concept of community or culture. But kids have a lot of trouble with that. That's very difficult. It's very abstract. Um, okay, so, uh, so th uh, these are the data from the test. Uh, and uh, uh, I thought that you would find these interesting. The little gray circles are all of the, uh, the Ross students. The uh, red circles are the Ross means, uh, and the blue circles are the means we have from other data. Uh, we have you know, thousands of subjects in other data in the uh, uh, developmental testing service uh, studies. So, uh, so in other words, if, you know, if, uh, the key finding for you all, I think, is that, uh, is that the Ross students had higher scores uh, than, the, than the, the averages that we get in the other samples, and that it gets b uh, even bigger with the older ages. So here it's uh, relatively close, you know, uh, uh, 8.9 uh, and 9.1 or something like that. And it, it gets bigger here, and here it's quite large, and out for these last three. So, uh, so you, the Ross kids are, are giving uh, 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 levels of understanding that are uh, well ahead of uh, what's expected for their age. Uh, now, I, I hope that <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I hope that means that you guys are doing a great job of teaching about culture yeah. at Ross. <laughs> uh, it could also mean that we have a biased sample. <laughs> yes. Do you think that that will change since when you did the study, the fourth grade? The, the early uh, childhood and, and lower school was fairly new. Right. Now That's that, right. Now that we're moving up the grades and we're starting to see our kids move through middle school mm -hmm. and up, and having been exposed to the cultural history from an earlier age, yes. do you think that will change? Well, I, I, or how do you think it will change? I, well, I certainly hope it would change. I would hope that, uh, that the kids who have been here for years would, uh, would show uh, a, a much more powerful effect. Uh, 
because they would have had years of uh, really uh, working with this framework of uh, understanding cultures around the world. Uh, I, you know, the the uh, um, from the beginnings, I've I've been really impressed with the with the framework, and um, I, uh, I I think, for example, of uh, La Convivencia, where uh, that's uh, you know, it's a beautiful idea to go to uh, an example where uh, Islam and uh, Christianity and uh, uh, Judaism could live together for a thousand years <laughs> in peace. That's just a really remarkable achievement. And, uh, and most people have no clue that anything like that happened. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, really interesting findings. I've been teaching anthropology for a long time. Uh -huh. um, and one of the intuitions that I've always had is that learning about other cultures um, and trying to do it in such a way that students actually feel some kind of empathy and can uh -huh. sort of have an yes. empathic extension yes. with other cultures right. actually helps develop critical thinking skills. Yes. The ability to kind of step outside of your own mental model and try out another perspective, which seems yeah. to be the yeah. basis for critical thinking. Yeah, critical thinking requires perspective taking. That's one of the fundamental parts of it. Mm. Um, uh, and so, so I, I think that, that, that makes a lot of sense to so me. So my, yeah. my question is, I mean, it seems like this research bears that out, that mm -hmm. it's not just, you know, with certain developmental stages, people can, you know, grasp um, different cultural perspectives, but also the reverse, that studying different cultural perspectives may be a really apt way of getting them to think in abstract systems or to think outside of their own mental models or yes. take on different perspectives. Yeah, that, that's right. I, I think that that's a good observation. Uh, I, 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 I'm thinking of uh, my friend uh, Bruno de la Chiesa, who some of you met when he was here a few years ago. Uh, who um, uh, actually wrote an article in our journal that says essentially, uh, if you only speak one language, you're uh, you're a very limited human being. <laughs> I mean, he's not he's trying not to be insulting, but that's kind of the the, ba the basic message. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, you know, I I think we you have to understand cultural variation and language variation if you're going to uh, be an anthropologist. Uh, uh, and I think uh, maybe that's one of the fundamental characteristics that we need to have for being good human beings as well. So, yeah? Um, I would like to <coughs> invite you back because I, I find it um, interesting that I love this. This looks great. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Feels a little abstract to me. And I'm it wondering <laughs> as, we, as we go, uh, as we brought the kids in, the international kids mm -hmm. in, and watching the interactions, whether it be in a boarding house or at dinner or at lunch, mm -hmm. specifically lunch, let's say, um, that we have this concern of boarding versus day and international versus American. Right. But I would love to see how it actually works when I can talk theoretically about having an understanding right. of someone else right. versus sitting with them at dinner and over time uh, watching those conversations at brunch has right. been phenomenal. Yes, right. And so right. Uh, I only bring it to the idea that, sure, I can be nonviolent until somebody attacks my daughter, and right. then suddenly I'm not so nonviolent <laughs> That's anymore. right, exactly. Okay. exactly. So uh, I'm just wondering, I think it's worth uh, studying because we assume that it's good to have the kids intermingle. I also believe that you need to actually guide and support, and you want yeah. support in a lot of this that uh, intermingling uh, is, is a real necessity. Yeah, you know, there's a, uh, there's a, there are some classic studies about that, that whole process. And one of the most, uh, one of the first ones that really had an impact was uh, when, when Harry Truman integrated the troops after World War II. Uh, uh, everybody thought it was going to lead to much better understanding across the races of black and white. And instead, it led to worse uh, prejudice. Um, uh, on average, um, uh, and uh, you know, so, so that's a uh, that that that's a really important point, uh, and um, uh, um, the um, so we need to really be paying attention to how we're doing it, uh, and 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 we need to be assessing all along the way what's actually happening. This is the point about research schools, right? So for this, this is the first study. We would love to have another study. Uh, of course, we have to get the funds to do it in which we would uh, interview at least 100 more students so we would have a better sample and a more representative sample so that we, uh, and we would love to interview, you know, 150 students at another school, at least one other school, 
that uh, focuses on uh, uh, something about international education, like maybe international baccalaureate program. Uh, uh, and then see, uh, you know, uh, compare them to see what, how, how they differ, how they're similar. Uh, uh, and um, so, uh, you know, I'm hoping uh, uh, that, that in some of our conversations we can figure out how to make those things happen. We, we don't want to stop now. We want to instead create an, a set of assessments that you can actually use. So the, the idea would be you would have, I mean, so like the simplest version would be you have a computer program and you go online. I mean, your student can go online and they can write answers to questions about cultural issues. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and then uh, uh, we can analyze them to see where they are in the learning pathway uh, and then uh, help them to, uh, to move their learning ahead. Uh, and that would help you, potentially, to, uh, because you would be able to see what the learning pathway is that this kid is showing and how you could facilitate their learning. Um, so I, I hope that that's of interest to you all. It's something where we're, we're trying to create these DISCO tests, which we uh, expect to mostly give away, at least for public free schools, uh, so that, um, so that we, um, uh, you know, uh, like uh, st uh, teachers can use them to, uh, to do assessments and students can use them to, to assess their own learning. Uh, one of the things that we've been able to do is to create drop-down menus uh, for coding that are not abstract. So they don't require you to be able to do skill analysis, uh, but uh, they just use a set of categories that come out of what the kids uh, say. Uh, and so, uh, so uh, uh, our experience so far has been that lots of, that for all teachers just about, and, and most, uh, many of the students can do that coding on their own. Uh, and uh, uh, we think that, uh, so we think we can create an assessment system that you all can use uh, with your students, uh, either entering what they say to you uh, yourself or uh, actually having them write it themselves. Uh, and then you can use that to assess their understanding, how it's developing, and how you can facilitate it. Um, yes? Kurt, I have some data collection questions. Uh -huh. uh, a larger Good. sample size would make me much more comfortable about Absolutely. what's shown on the board Absolutely. right now. Because yep. to me, that's stats teacher. That's a little, mm. But uh, yep. a couple questions. The one to two years of college, that just means that the people that were, that are like the 358 students in the, the one to two years of college, are those actual, are those all students? Are they actually just the ones that went to college from those schools, or are those actually, are they just a group of students two, one to two years after school? The 358 is <laughs> from the, the, um, the, the uh, DTS sample, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and so, and they're students who have had one or two years of college, but not more. Okay, so that my question is though, what about the students that didn't, I think that's a fair comparison between right. those two because most of our students go to college, so that would be right. a fair comparison. Right. Would also be really interesting would be the, from that group of people, from the, the ones that didn't go to college, right. one to two years later, three to four years later, just to see how that line changes as well, right. to compare and contrast across the board. And I think yep. you'll find something pretty yeah. interesting there too. Absolutely, and you know, there's almost no research that does that. It's just appalling. There's one really nice study that came out of Minnesota uh, that uh, uh, tr tracked um, uh, graduates of the University of Minnesota for, th for 10 years uh, and uh, uh, on moral judgment. <laughs> and it, it sh actually showed that, uh, that there was a big difference across majors. Uh, I don't know how many of you would like this, but the, the science and engineering majors didn't show any improvement in their moral reasoning uh, for 10 years after they graduated. The humanities majors showed huge improvement in their moral reasoning after they graduated. And the social science majors showed moderate improvement in their moral reasoning. So, but there are, we needed studies like that. We, you know, we really need to look at long-term changes in how people grow, and we don't expect them to stop growing cognitively after they've graduated. Yeah, I'm just really interested in what the other 75% of the population thinks after they leave high school. Yes, right. Or if they finish it. That would yeah. be interesting as well. Right, yeah, yeah, for sure. Other questions? Yes. 
I'm thinking of Bach and his kids and the relationship <laughs> all between... All 20, wasn't it 20? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and all good musicians. Uh, um, in the relationship between genetic evolution selectivity uh -huh. and Baldwinian cultural evolutionary yes. selectivity of use it or lose it. Of course, Bach had both. Bach's children had well, both. Well, that's what I think the middle classes have because, you know, in suburban Boston where my niece goes to school, they right. offer Arabic and Chinese in the high yes, school. Yes, that's right. Uh, and and my daughter's learning Mandarin. She's yeah. quite good at it, and actually. You know, the, in <laughs> the inner city, yep. they won't do that. Yep. So I had a conversation with an RGA teacher here last year, and she said... Um, that one of his students said, I don't want to go to museums, that's white rich people's culture. It's mm -hmm. not my culture. Right. And, and I thought about that a lot because I take my kids to museums and right. you know, they grew up to be professors. And, yes, you know. right. So uh, the middle class, it seems to me, has a double whammy of both genetic selectivity, your wife goes to college, you pick somebody who's in, yes, right. in college, and then this Baldwinian evolution, right. and it creates an emergent new state Mm -hmm. that just takes off, and it's really hard for the rest of humanity to keep up. That's right, that's right. So we, we become very facile at, uh, at text processing, for example, uh, and that's, uh, that, you know, and that seems, uh, so uh, many of us who, uh, who are in academics are, are just really good at reading and extracting ideas, at least from material that we're familiar, that's in the content we're familiar with, uh, and that's, uh, uh, th that's n not the way it is for most of the population, absolutely. Uh, and it's even more true in, uh, uh, in, you know, in the third world, of course, than, than it is here. Uh, we, uh, we're trying to do work with people in China and India, uh, among other uh, countries, uh, to, uh, in order to uh, help them uh, uh, improve their education systems. We just had a big conference in Barbados this summer uh, working with the, uh, the West Indies nations, uh, too. Uh, and uh, you know that's uh, that's um, uh, important and, and gratifying, uh, uh, but it, it's also uh, the, the aspects of it that are quite depressing. So uh, you know our Indian collaborators tell us that that most of the people who graduate from Indian universities uh, can't even write a, a one-page uh, essay. Um, they can't write a memorandum. Uh, yeah, and uh, you know that's. Uh, uh, so, so universities are very different in different cultures in different parts of the but world. But shouldn't you be studying the external reinforcements? Because you can't abstract the student. That's right. You study the school and the student. Uh, if there is this whole cultural parental thing right. where the parents are, are dissing what's going on in the new context or they're reinforcing it. Right. That's right. Uh, uh, so it, it's, it's pretty... Uh, uh, you know, human beings are complicated. That's uh, one of the things that, I, that I, when I started out to create these kinds of tools, uh, uh, I was really frustrated because uh, the typical psychologist uh, says, uh, there are two kinds of people, um, you know, uh, introverts and extroverts, you know, or whatever. Uh, and then somebody else comes along and says, oh, no, there are four kinds of people, you know, a <laughs> uh, two-by-two table. Uh, uh, and, you know, introverts and extroverts who are uh, 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 sensation seekers and, and sensation avoiders, you know. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's so much more complicated and interesting than that. We're, you know, we human beings are very richly endowed uh, to become many different things. Uh, and uh, we need uh, s uh, developmental and psychological and educational tools that help us to see how that happens and help us to analyze it so that we can become more effective as teachers and learners so that we can end up with, uh, 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 you know, 100% or 95% of our students getting effectively educated as opposed to 20 or 25%. Uh, yes? Have any studies been done on this uh, comparing children who actually were read to nightly and mm -hmm. those who weren't? Oh, yes. Uh, well, it depends what you mean by studies. Uh, th there's a really influential study that came out just a few years ago, uh, which looked at the number of words that kids are exposed to by their parents. Uh, and the differences are just unbelievable. Uh, you know, like uh, highly educated f uh, parents uh, uh, expose their kids to something like five times as many words as low education parents. Uh, and you know, that has to have just an enormous effect. And it starts at birth. 
Uh, you know, they're reading to them uh, when, they're, when, they, when the kids don't have a clue what a book is, uh, <laughs> but they're still hearing all those words. Uh, uh, and, um, uh, and so they, bec uh, you know, they end up with an implicit vocabulary, which is gigantic. And that's an enormous advantage. And do they then become that 25%? Uh, yeah, I think they, most of them do, um, as, w as we were just saying, right? You know, uh, uh, I, I'm pretty, uh, I know that three of my four kids are going to be in that 25%. <laughs> I'm not yet sure about the fourth one. <laughs> um, yes? Yeah, uh, yes, the microphone. Would, um, do you think that if, if the, the test studied bilingual families, then mm -hmm. that would you know, e be even higher? Uh, yes, uh, uh, I think that's right. And uh, um, the, the, um, uh, the whole issue about um, um, bilingualism and multilingualism uh, is, uh, is distorted because, uh, you know, well, we have, English language culture is very imperialistic, and a whole lot of people who speak English don't think they should speak any other languages. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, Russian is very imperialistic, and a whole lot of Russians don't think they should need to speak any other languages. And China is imperialistic, and they, they basically don't think they should have to speak other languages. You know, so you end up with, except that they're changing a lot, the Chinese. I, you have to give them credit. They're, uh, you know, English is being taught everywhere now. Uh, and uh, it's, it's really changing the society. Uh, um, sorry? In Russia, too. In Russia, too. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, but, but not in the U.S. <laughs> you know, we continue to avoid even having the kids learn Spanish, even though the, it would be so useful for them. Uh, I'm proud to say my daughter, uh, my older daughter, is about to go to Ecuador for a year to, to, uh, to improve her Spanish and teach English. Um, so anyway, the, there are... Um, uh, you know, I think the, 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 uh, the uh, many parts of the world are multilingual, uh, naturally. Uh, uh, certainly much of Western Europe, uh, much of, uh, uh, of the, uh, many other parts of the world. I mean, like in India, uh, you have to speak two or three languages because otherwise you can't get a, you can't uh, function very well. You have to do at least English and one of the native languages, you know. Um, uh, and, uh, and that gives you a very different perspective. Uh, so a whole lot of the world is like that, and uh, uh, I think it's just appalling that we're not. Uh, is that a, a good sad note to end on? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, other questions or comments? I guess it must be time to end, huh? Okay, thank you. <laughs>